And so that is the heart. It's that replication. Mm. It's you're pouring into someone, and now they're going to grow. Then they're going to pour into someone. They're going to grow. And we all, everybody does this. It's just, are we doing a good job at it? Everyone you meet every single day is fighting a battle you may know nothing about. We're all in the process of overcoming. I'm Justin Wren, and my story has been heard by millions of people through my book, my TED Talk, podcast interviews, TV shows, professional fighting, and my foundation, Fight for the Forgotten. I believe we are all overcomers if we choose to overcome. We all have the option. I've been given the opportunity to overcome childhood trauma, sexual abuse, immense bullying, depression, suicidal ideation, substance use disorder, and I am a two-time suicide survivor. We are here to have conversations with some of the greatest minds of our time. Get ready to be inspired and to receive the tools and game plan to win this fight called life. Thank you for being here, for showing up for yourself. You, me, we have overcome 100% of our darkest days. I'm not done yet, and neither are you. This is your invitation to overcome. Patrick Perez. Whoop, whoop. Pac-Man. <laughs> Pac- El Pac-Man. Pac- yeah, I was literally like eating that. right before we got here. I'm like, I need food. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I'm grateful you're here. This is awesome. I, I am honored. So I bow, I bow, I bow. So thank you. All. <laughs> yeah. Bring absolutely. me back to Austin. We're just on the outskirts in Bastrop. So I'm like, I get to go back home. Yes. Yeah. How long have you been in Bastrop? Almost exactly one year. Okay. So and Austin before that? Austin since 82, 83. Oh, wow. I saw the statue on the Capitol get put in. That's, that's, wow. yeah, that's one of the fun what stories. What is that statue? You, Amy used to think it was what? The Statue I of thought Liberty? I it was the Statue of Liberty. When she was a little <laughs> girl? <laughs> it's the goddess of liberty or something. Mm. So very similar. Factoid. Our capital is taller than the one in DC, so. Well, everything's Texas. bigger in Texas, yeah. right? Take it's that, gotta yeah. be. Get yeah. Yes, awesome. goddess of liberty. You are correct. Oh, All good. right. Uh-huh. Perfect. There we go. I don't need. They have those on some of the, the Roman denarius is that, uh, I have one around my neck. It's, uh, Marcus oh. Aurelius. Oh. Um, so it's, uh, on the back is, uh, Antonius Pius. Mm-hmm. And so it's the fourth and the fifth good emperor of Rome. Anyways, a lot of the coins will have the Liberty, uh, goddess of Liberty and all sorts of stuff, oh, yeah. um, on there. So and I believe ours faces South to kind of honor Mexico or how Texas came from Mexico. So it's a cool history lesson. Yeah. I just use my degree. Oh, there you go. Yes. What is your degree? Did communication and then a minor in history, wanted to major in history, but my history teacher told me, don't do it. So she's like, you don't want a job, do you? I was like, oh, never mind. Well, well what drew you to history? Like what was, what it's, was what? your passion about it or oh, what excited you about There's it? There's a few. So at the time, so I'll go through waves. So Civil War was a big one. Civil War, just, I mean, the history of that, because everybody's like, you know, America is just so great. And it's like, you don't know, like, the the fact that people had to kill each other for what they believe, but friends, neighbors, I mean, it just got that crazy. Yeah. What, what, what show were we watching last night? Oh, Vikings Valhalla. Mm-hmm. We started that. And it was like the Vikings with the old gods and the Vikings that became Christians and mm. they were battling each other mm-hmm. about their faith. And I, I, I had thought about something in history that I never looked up, but it was like, I wonder what it was like for the American revolution where it's Christians fighting Christians. And yeah. like, how did they, how did they reconcile that? Exactly. You know, was it just tyranny? Or I was interested in the history of that last night. So and I guess we have much, to do some digging. God is for us. God is for us. So yeah. then it's and like, not you. We're going to win. Yeah. 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 And that's, I mean, so even as progressive as it is in Austin, just moving to Bash Shop is like, oh, that's a Confederate statue. But yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't want to say I honor that, but I'm like, they were fighting for something they believe it may be wrong, but you know, this is history. This is, I mean, the blood is in the soil and this is what Texas grew out of. And I think Texas was the last Confederate state to kind of like say, okay, we're done. And, yeah. But don't quote me on that. Yeah. Ryan Holiday, um, who wrote The Daily Stoic, and then he writes about Marcus Aurelius. And has a He's in bookstore in Bastrop. Oh, so yeah. Painted Porch. Just saw mm-hmm. that book. The Painted Porch. We, yes. That place is awesome. They have this huge uh, chimney. Yeah. Books. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Incredible. So he lives there. Yeah. He lives there. He writes his books there. Um, he moved out of Austin to Bastrop. Okay. And I think he's got some land and goes on walks awesome. every day. But one of his things is not just the Statue of Liberty, but there was supposed to be um, something that Victor Frankl was championing, and it was the Statue of Responsibility. Oh. And Amy, could you bring a picture of that up for yeah. 
viewers on YouTube and Spotify, they can watch the video. But it's kind of cool. It's these two arms uh, lifting each other up. Like, I don't think they're grabbing hands. I think they're grabbing like forearms. And it's almost like reaching down and lifting one up. And Grant, if we could pull that up so you can see. But see that right there? The Statue oh, nice. of Responsibility. Nice. It was saying, with liberty comes responsibility. Oh, gosh. That's, that's, that should be taught in every school. That, yeah. I mean, right there. I mean, <laughs> why, do you, why do you think, I mean, you were a teacher, so they teach about the Statue of Liberty all the time. <clears throat> but I think that is important, like the Statue of Responsibility, where it's like, hey, we have a responsibility to take care of each other. Exactly. Like a tribe or our country or our countrymen, at least, and, and the world. That's what was, that's what I would say from the teacher side, that's what was broken was caring for your other caring for your neighbor during the whole pandemic because everybody was so split up where everybody was virtual students would go a whole year without ever meeting another student mm, that's and, hard yeah it was insane so I, it was I, developmental years it was it was I, I had one student tell me like mister you're the only person that i know on the whole campus i'm like wow. but i'm i just started like two weeks ago yeah and no nobody talks in the zoom or the the online platform we had you're not on campus. So it's like these kids are literally just in their rooms Secluded, all day. Yeah. Isolated. It's insane. It's insane. And to be at that age, the, the brain is developing until you're what, 25, 26. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, what really is happening? We're, we're, we're not going to know the long-term effects until years and years later. Right. And you, you could probably speak to this more, but what, aren't the most formative years like four to 10 or six to 12 or something like it's, that? Those, those years... I'll, I'll say it kind of comes in those chunks. So yeah, zero to four, you know, those are the formative mm. years and then four to the, to the teen years, that's where you're, you're, you're becoming, but it's like another version of you. So those core was the core memories that mm. are made there. I mean, they still impact you years and years later, you know? Yeah. Well, I know I've had to do a lot of work, um, especially these last two years because part of overcome is talking about, you know, how do we win this fight called life? Mm -hmm. And how do we rise up and overcome life's greatest challenges? And two of mine have been, I survived suicide twice and I've been to treatment twice mm -hmm. uh, for substance abuse. And through peeling back the onion or unraveling that, I, I see a lot of inner child wounds or things from my past. And you've probably heard of the ACEs or the Adverse Childhood Experience Survey. No. No? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, some trauma-informed teachers are really trying to lead the charge on that. And if you have four out of 10, you are 15 times more likely to attempt suicide in your life. That's crazy. Yeah. And Sad. there's so many kids out there. Um, actually, a board member, uh, a Fight for the Forgotten, the nonprofit I started, 64% of her children in elementary school have four or more aces. 64%. That is, She's that, in the inner city. That's concerning. That Isn't is, that concerning? Yeah, that is uh, a generation. Yeah. You know, because it's not just one area. It's it's across the country, across the world. Probably. Yeah. And I have seven or eight out of 10, which is a pretty high score. But those kids, think about elementary kids that already have that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow. So just thinking about that. And then on top of it, not just major traumas, but micro traumas and even the micro trauma of being isolated and yeah. not having friends. Yeah. And let me ask, so when you kind of peeled those layers back, what was your outlet? You know, cause that, that's one thing I'm always trying to champion with students is like, what is your outlet? What is a healthy outlet instead of? Yeah. So I would say it was healthy for a long time until it got unhealthy. But my first outlet was wrestling and then MMA. Oh, um, nice. martial arts changed my life. And, um, I think that it, martial arts does that for anyone that finds, it. I think 3.4 million youth that are doing martial arts in the U S today and something like over 30%, close to 40% found martial arts because they're being bullied at school. Boom. And I think, uh, on bullying statistics, 180,000 kids or it's 160, um, 160 or 180,000 kids every day skip school because of fear of being bullied or they are being bullied. So that's over 3 million school days lost every month from students being bullied. And one out of three students will be bullied this year. Mm -hmm. um, some think that's going to go to one out of two because cyberbullying and everything mm -hmm. online. And so for me, the outlet was, was I was 13 years old and... I just had a, a, a second huge humiliating moment in front of m my entire school. And so especially the, the like popular clique or, mm -hmm. or group. 
And I went to, uh, uh, in Arlington, there's like a big flea market. Uh, I forget what it's called, but, um, anyways, I went there and I was going to buy a BB gun cause we had a bunch of rats in our barn. And instead when I got there, um, I've walked across a, a used VHS store that I think originally drew me in because they were selling, have I told you this? They were, no. they were selling flying squirrels at the VHS <laughs> tape shop. Like it was like live? A, yeah, flying? yeah, you could buy a flying squirrel as a pet. They had parrots also Those were and the days. VHS <laughs> tapes. <laughs> Those were the days. So it was like a pet shop VHS, <laughs> used VHS store. So it was a very weird unique group. pet shop. Yeah, weird pet like. shop. I think they had lizards and snakes too. It was it was it little was, gremlin in the back. Yeah, you can buy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, they are probably selling Furbies at least. I don't know. But I, I walk in and I found UFC two through ten or two through eleven. It was missing UFC one, and when I picked that up. <clears throat> I just thought these guys don't get bullied, and mm, 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 yeah, mm. and th and then I also <laughs> just thought, um, you know, this was like a chess match. I, when I, especially when I started watching it, like I fell in love with that. It was sumo versus taekwondo and jujitsu <laughs> versus boxing That's and awesome. all these uh, Olympic wrestlers versus Olympic judo, and I was like, wow. And there was no wrestlers at my school, but there was a dad. And he was a good wrestling coach and he had a club team for like elementary and middle school kids. And I was in high school. So I joined that club team being the only high schooler and the only wrestler from my school. Mm. And um, he started coaching me and that was my outlet. He said, hey, you can be great at this. Even though I lost every match my first year of wrestling, mm. maybe my first year and a half. And I won, well, I won one match by one point because the guy like slipped on a, a pool of sweat, heavyweights, lots of sweat on the mats. And awesome. so... Uh, yeah, and, and so that became my outlet, and my parents made a lot of sacrifices for me. They sent me 67 miles from a little country town in southwest Fort Worth called Crowley to East Dallas. Um, I have to leave before the sun came up and get back home after the sun came down, and they sent me there because there's two Olympic gold medalists as the high school coaches. Wow. And so I, I say that because you have an outlet in dance. And that's, and, um, yeah, yeah. The, the Flea market, VHS, that's where it all started. That that's is where it crazy. All I Found am you. There. Really? I, tra I, tra I travel through time. <laughs> I've come back. That's exactly what it was bullying through elementary school, middle school, even on, into high school, getting bullied. I had lots of friends, very social, but still, there's always that internal battle. Yeah. You know, as I say, behind every smile, there is a struggle. Hmm. And so there was this point where. I was like, you know, I'm, I went through puberty. Yay, puberty. I'm, I'm, I'm a man. But it's just like I'm still getting picked on. I'm still getting bullied. I'm a huge band nerd. You know, Pflugerville, Panthers, you know, Rock On. They, that was my family. That was where the rhythm and everything started coming in. But I was still just a little nerd. So one day we were at the flea market off of 290 down the street walking through. And I just see this huge group of teenagers around this kiosk. I was like, what is, what's this? Little TV, VHS tape. It was Radiotron, which was in LA. It was this huge like breakdance competition, b-boy competition, urban street arts. And I'm just watching these guys on the, the screen spinning on their head, spinning on their back. I mean, all these moves. I'm like, what is this? I mean, I was transfixed. I was levitated. I was raptured. And then I looked around at all these kids. Like, these are the kids that are bullying me. You know, these are like all mm. the, the, you know, wannabe cholos because I'm like, how can you be a cholo in Pflugerville, Texas? You know, it's <laughs> like, orale vaca. It's one of those things where a lot of people are just pretending. And so I figured, what if I danced like that? If I can dance like that, people won't pick on me. If I can mm. dance like that, I won't need to ask out any girl to the school dance because I will be the, the man. I can just dance. And so started getting into b-boying break dancing right around my junior year, junior year of high school there were some dance crews in austin that were making this resurgence and so there were some of the dancers at my school and i see them in the hallways just like oh he just spun on his hand like three times a 90 that's sick then at my church all oh, these guys are doing k kicks and all these like sick moves so it was like all of a sudden i just started seeing b-boys b-boys and i was like i gotta be a b-boy i gotta break free from this nerdy little kid that I am because I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. This is my outlet. So practicing in my parents' garage, one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, it became my obsession. Watching videos, seeing it on the news and 
It was cool. I remember my dad recorded a newscast because they had some break dancers on there. So he was like, yeah, wow. I can record this for, for Patrick. And I'm like, this is sick. So, so your dad did that for you. Saw yeah. your interest and yeah. supported your interest. He did. He That's did. great. And it was this time in life where all the, the dancers in Austin were growing. B-Boy City was, it still is. What does going, B-Boy stand for? Is uh, it break, break dance? Boy. Break, break Boy. Break Boy. Okay. So you're pretty much breaking on the, the break beat of the, the song. The, the, where all the music leaves and it's just a boom, boom, ch, the boom, 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 ch. It's the break. And so these dancers come out and you're, you're bah, 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 top rock floor work, power moves. Whenever you're doing that, do, do you have to put down something special on the floor or no? Like it, say practicing in your garage. Are you yeah. putting down like a mat or like cardboard or something? Concrete, I've seen that up. Just okay. con- yeah, just concrete. <laughs> just hardcore. get the broom, sweep. Yeah. And eventually, you did, yeah, one, once we started getting sponsored, uh, Red Bull bought us like this $1,500 dance floor. This wow. is later on in the, in the stories. Sure. But in the beginning, it was just concrete or going to a rec center using their floor. And so that's where I started thinking, like, this is so cool. So I would go to these rec centers to practice with the other dancers. But they already had their cliques. They already had their little crews. And here I was just like, hey, guys, you know, I'm all chipper and dandy here. Let's dance. And so once again, even getting into that culture, I felt isolated because I, mm. I didn't belong. I was not part of their crew. You weren't like invited in, welcomed. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was more like AOL 1.0, let's see, where can I see dancers at? And, and looking that stuff up. And so two, three years just practicing by myself, learning, I mean, literally downloading steps and printing them out. Like, here's how you do the six step. Here's how you do a K kick. And it got to the point where I was like, this is cool. So I'd start dancing at church during worship because they always had, it was a charismatic church growing up. So, you know, people with flags and all these other dancers. And I'm like, well, pff, they can dance. I can dance. So I'd get up there and just start break dancing. And they're like, what is happening? That was <laughs> pretty bold. It was an outlet because you never, you never know until somebody tells you, don't do that. Don't right. do that, which that happened. It, it caused uh, a lot of wounds when uh, someone in leadership actually literally came up during one service and, yeah, we're not going to do that. I mean, it was just like, but I mean, at this time I was like, God has given me this gift. God is, you, I want to do this. This is bigger. This is my outlet. And the ironic thing was I was using dance at, around this time. I was about 20, 21 to start mentoring at-risk youth. Because they would see me dancing and like, oh, mister, that's pretty cool. Can you show me? He's like, cool, here's a move. By the way, how, how's school? By the way, how, how are things at home? A lot of single parent uh, raising you. And so that is where I started seeing like I could use this as a bridge. Mm. You know, I mean, I'm not the best dancer, but I'm going to be an available dancer. And so I started using this dance to mentor at-risk kids, uh, students from the St. John's area. And that's where I began getting this vision of like, imagine one day what it would be like to use this, but on a bigger scale. Mm. Dance, talk to kids in, in juvie, talk to kids in, in schools. Imagine what that would be like. So I'd go back to the garage, practice, practice, like, oh, one day, one day I'm going to dance in front of thousands. And it just, it, it took many, many, many years. It's, yeah. not an, it's that whole, like, it only took 10 years to become an overnight success. But that was my outlet. That was, that's when I knew that b-boying, breakdancing is not just a fad. Everybody's like, it's a fad from the 80s. It's like, and it actually started back in the late 60s, flourished in the 70s, and then was consumerized in the 80s with the whole hip hop. It was consumerized. So on it.com slash overcome. I am so grateful for the best supplements in the world or that I've ever taken is supporting this show. And thank you to the listeners for supporting on it at on it.com slash overcome and supporting yourself, supporting the show and supporting one of the best companies because I love going to on it ATX gym and working out with their best in class, world-class trainers and their supplements really do. I think embody uh, even the spirit of their trainers. Like it's just the best that I've ever had. I mean, your workouts are looking amazing and you. you are mainly using these. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's mostly all I'm using. And I'm just really, really grateful for on it and for them having the best in class, meaning 
the total human. I'm getting the best of on it and everything they make in a day support, a night support. Uh, I love their alpha brain for me. I get it in the total human, but I love getting it also in the focus shot before a podcast. I feel like I get in the flow state faster, stay there longer. I really get in the flow of conversation and, uh, I love it. And I love the tropical one. The, that's my favorite flavor of it. Instead of the peach, peach is good too, but I love the tropical passion fruit. And then what do I love that I have not talked about on the show yet? You pulled it up for us. Shroom tech sport. Yes. Why? Why don't you go down to the ingredients and read it, but the cordyceps. Performance and endurance. It says, go faster, go longer, more reps. And that's true. For me, I love getting messages from fans of the show, whether it's on Instagram and DMs or just comments. Whenever I post about uh, on it, if you go back to my last one, you'll see people literally commenting that Shroom Tech Sport took their cardio to a new level. And I really feel that too. The cordyceps in there... um, it just is energy boosting. Like you feel well, it like- It has green tea extract too, which is cool. Yeah, absolutely. It gives you a little extra something. Ashwagandha, which is so hot right now. <laughs> and rhodiola. But they were using it before it was hot, before it was cool. <laughs> they were. They, they were the trendsetters. That it was, yes, <laughs> they knew that it, we needed it. We needed it in our body before our sport, whatever sport it might be. Even if it's just yoga or going on a walk or run or going out on a hike in nature, but I'm using it for jujitsu. I come back to MMA and we're talking to all sorts of organizations about where I'm going to land, what's going to be home. And I know on fight day and fight week, I'll be taking Shroom Tech Sport. They have some uh, clinical studies too here on their website. Just go to onit.com slash Shroom Tech Sport and Shroom Tech dash sport. And then if you scroll down, they've got product testing and, you know, double blind studies that they've done that have shown statistically significant increases in performance, which is very cool. Well, I feel it and you can go see it and read all about it. And that's what I love about on it is they they're set apart in the supplement industry, which can be really shady. It can be one manufacturer in China producing like 80 different companies stuff and it gets mixed in there and people that yeah, just private label USADA, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. People that get tested by USADA, all of a sudden their creatine has steroids in it and Whoa. it's because, or it has weed in it. Someone that has celiac <gasps> like me, all of a yeah. sudden it's manufacturing the same thing that has peanuts. If you have a peanut allergy or, or wheat and with gluten and, um, this is safe. It's really exactly what it says it has in there. There's studies that support it. And when you support on it, you're supporting the show, you're supporting our guest, you're supporting Fight for the Forgotten. And most of all, you're supporting yourself, your health, your physical well being, but also your mental well being by just fueling your brain with onit.com slash overcome. Well, I think you said something interesting there. And maybe we can both speak to it because you said something about being an available Mm. answer. Mm -hmm. I have this quick story I can share that um, I got asked to speak, uh, like professionally get paid speaking engagements nine nine times before I finally said yes. I think I said, I think I said no, like nine times. And the reason was I grew up with a speech therapist Mm. and from kindergarten to sixth grade, like I was fighting a stutter Mm. and just... Uh, when I was really young, I, I couldn't say fish. It would be, f- no matter how hard I'd say it, it would say, f- I would say fush. I'd try, <laughs> I'd really try to say fish and it would just come out fush. And, uh, and if I get really tired now, kind of like into exhaustion or kind of, I don't know, uh, just overwhelmed, like a stutter will come back. Mm. Amy's only heard it maybe a couple of times. And, um, I didn't even notice, really. Yeah, and then I would tell her, and she's like, well, I didn't really notice, but <laughs> I notice, and I, I have to catch it and go back to some of those tools, slow down, and think about what I'm going to say. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes, especially in front of a group, I really overthink what I'm going to say. And so I said no so many times, and I was at the airport, and I got a call from my fight agent. And I'd taken a year off from fighting because I'd been going through addiction, depression. And I was like, I need to get my life right before I go back to fighting. Cause it's such a roller coaster ride. Um, the ups are really high and the lows are really low. And so I wasn't doing anything for work, but I was, I was doing some appearances, doing some training for people. And here comes all these speaking engagements. And I keep saying no, though, and no, no, no. And he calls me and I, I got offered to like do the commencement ceremony for the uh, Air Force Academy that is in awesome. Colorado Springs. Wow. I said no. Oh, come and on. And he said, he come said, on. Yeah, he said, he said, why not? He goes, this is a paid gig. And I was like, well, 
I'm just, I, I have, uh, I go, I, I'm a fighter, not a speaker. I don't have the ability mm-hmm. to do that. I got off the phone with him. He turned it down and a friend called me. Actually, I called a friend said, Hey, all these speaking engagements keep coming up. He goes, well, maybe that's an opportunity. The universe or God's bringing into your life. You should say yes. I said, well, I just said no. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he's like, Hey man, I, I want you to like pray about it. And I was like, well, uh, nah, I'm not going to do that type thing. <laughs> and he said, no, really do it. And I'm like, I'm at the airport. They're calling, you know, me to board. And he goes, pray about it right now. And I go, I'm about to get on the plane. Maybe I'll do it when I get home. He said, no, right now on the plane and, uh, or before you get on the plane. And I said, okay, with no intention to do it. So I get off the phone, he texts me and he says, uh, uh, he says, pray about it right now, all caps. And so, oh, and one of the things he said on the phone, he goes, is it that you don't have the ability or you don't have the availability to do oh, it? Oh, snap, goes, and, crackle. <laughs> yeah. So that, that kind of hit me like, oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe I don't have the ability, but I'm not even making myself available to see if I do or not. Mm. And in fighting, you really have to put yourself out there to test your skills. Like you mm-hmm. got it in the gym, but do you have it in the fight? You'll never know unless you get in there. Um, so anyways, I, I say a little prayer basically. And I didn't know really what I was praying to, who I was praying to. I just said, God, if you want me to do this, you got to slap me upside the head with it. And if not, I'm not going to do it. You got to make it real. And, um, like amen or something. Then I'm, <laughs> I'm on the jetway walking down. The engine catches fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I sit down and there's a guy sitting next to me and, uh, he's an older gentleman and I have a fight shirt on. And he asked me who I am, what I do. And I think I said hi to someone on the plane because I just got off the Ultimate Fighter TV show. And uh, so he starts asking some of my story. I tell him a little bit about it. And then uh, he keeps asking me more. I tell him a little more. He keeps asking me more. I tell him a little bit more. And he stops me and goes, have you ever been asked to speak to share your story? Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Uh, yeah. He goes, when was the last time? I was like, um... Uh, right before I stepped on the plane, <laughs> he said, he said, where are you speaking? And I said, I said, no. <laughs> and, uh, he's like, well, why? And I go, cause I'm a fighter, not a speaker. I don't have the ability to do that. He says, well, I've spoke to more prisoners than any human on earth over 2 million. And, uh, he goes, I've trained hundreds of speakers. That's what I do. Wow. I help them find that ability nice. by like training them. I'll train you. You got to do it. And I'm like, uh, no, I, I'm, I don't know, you know? And, He's like, well, let me ask you, have you ever prayed about it? <laughs> I was like, I was, That's the I was, hashtag of the day, yeah. pray about it. So I, I, pull, I pull out my phone and I show him the text from my friend saying, pray about it right now, exclamation point. Awesome. He goes, what'd you pray? And I said, God, I don't know. If you want me to do this, you got to make it real because I'm scared. I don't know how to do it. Um, but if you slap me upside the head with it, I'll do it. And uh, so he literally reached over behind my head and slapped the back of my awesome. head. <laughs> he that goes, is awesome. He goes, he goes, there you go. There's your sign. Anyways, his name was uh, Jack Murphy, Murph the Surf. He's since passed. But for years, he t- taught me how to speak at schools. And, um, that is and incredible. And he took me in over 100 different prisons wow. from like Folsom to San Quentin to like Huntsville. Uh, uh, what is that? Death Row to juvenile detention was my first one. I was terrified to speak. My hands were shaking. I was up there with an NFL player. I thought I bombed, and then all of a sudden, all the kids coming up to me telling me how grateful they are that I share my story. And it's like, wow, you know, I said no so many times, and then I finally said yes, and I probably did really bomb, you know, but the kids were nice. And since then, I've had a, a TED Talk I got to do in London and all sorts Heck of yeah. stuff. Like, opportunities have just, like, opened up. But I think there's a huge point there that you can speak to about, availability and ability, like the difference Definitely. between and, the two. And that's, I mean, there's just so much to unpack there. It's every battle begins within up here. We mm. talk ourselves out of it. You know, you thought it was a, you know, you couldn't do it until you yeah. tried. Mm. And so many people get in their own way because, oh, I can't, I, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do this dance move. I, I can't go speak. You mm. know, what are my credentials? I've never been through something crazy traumatic, but I like how you're saying that when you are available, when you make yourself available, it's about service to others. Mm. You know, live to serve. That was our, our dance crew's motto for years. Live decade. to serve. Live to serve. I love that. Two meanings, which I'll, I'll share in a second here. But yeah, it's not about being the best. It's about being available. It's it's not about being the most. I got the most followers. It's about being available. 
Because if we think about it, the people that really made a difference in our lives were those who were available. Mm. I can go back and remember Pastor Kenny. He was available. He poured spiritually into my life. There was Marty Gaines, the dean at our Bible college. He poured into me, dream a dream, do something big, make all the mistakes you can before the age of 30, because you know you can go, and if you fail, you still have time to rebound. Bob Mahalif from Toastmasters, my, my buddy in El, El Paso, all about business. So they were available, and they all had their own businesses and leadership, but it was because they took time to invest. Yeah. Well, yeah. let me ask you this, because you said Toastmasters. And I've been invited in that. And then I got in some called NSA, the National oh, Speakers yeah, Association. Yeah. And um, I, 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 people would joke with me when I told them that I'd said no to the first nine and finally took it on the 10th. Oh, before I got off that plane, Jack Murphy said, when we land, we're calling my assistant. You're, you're speaking in two weeks from now. Awesome. And I was, like, I was like, wait, what? And he said, uh, have you ever been to Dallas? We were flying from like Denver to Vegas or something. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, man, I grew up in Dallas. I graduated in Dallas. He's like, well, you'll get to go say hi to your mom, even if you're scared uh, about this. <laughs> like, you'll at least get to visit your mom. I was like, okay. And Jack's story is wild. He, uh, he was a professional surfer, won the world championship. He played the violin or fiddle in the um, Grand Ole Opry. Uh, but he also pulled off America's, still to this date, I'm pretty sure it's America's largest jewelry heist ever. <laughs> Um, and so he stole the, uh, Jack Murphy or Jack Murph, the surf. I think, uh, Amy's pulling it up here. It's like put that maybe on your a, resume. Maybe a picture of him. He was convicted of murder. Yes. So he, uh, was convicted, but he wasn't the one that did it. He was there when it happened. And so he, I don't think he got caught for the star of India or whatever it was, the JP Morgan collection in New York city. That is like, crazy. Yeah. What? And, uh, then the. The murder was basically, I think they were running drugs from like Cuba to Miami or something like that. And he was a water guy. So he knew all about the water and stuff like that. Anyways, a deal went bad and someone got, one or two people got killed. And um, he got, I think he was supposed to get released. 2,244 was his release date. Wow. And so how was I sitting with him on a plane? He had he a radical, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like the JP Morgan collection. No, he, he changed his life around. And he started to live to serve and the prison saw that somehow he got released on a technicality, I believe, or some way of evidence that wasn't right or correct. Anyways, he served like a year or two Wow. and, or maybe it was a bunch more than that. Maybe it was like 10 years. Um, and then he got released and a year or two later, he started going back into prisons and said he was going to dedicate his life to prisoners and seeing them get rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. Like he did. He said he was one of the lucky ones. Mm -hmm. Um, and anyways, I've never seen a guy that was so selfless and, and lived to really serve, not just the guys behind bars, but the people going into them, uh, to, I mean, I, I never thought I'd go in over a hundred different units. I've been in Corcoran state and I was three cells away from Charles Manson. He was sick. Wow. So I didn't get to talk to him, but people that started the Crips, all sorts of stuff. And then you see these light bulb moments come on whenever someone comes in to like, just be available to show up, yeah. show up for someone that the rest of society has said, like yep. you're worthless or you belong in a cage type thing. And, um, tell me, like, no, Hey man, we've all made mistakes. And how can you, how can you live your best life now? You know, maybe you get out, maybe you don't, if you get out, don't come back. And, and just to be there to encourage them with your own story and just to be there to talk, yeah. li listen, exactly, listen, exactly. So That's I think uh, showing up is what you were really talking about, like being available and show up, be it consistent. Is, yeah. And it's, there's the, so the whole service thing that, I mean, leadership is about relationship and relationship. You got to be available. Mm. You know, it's, it's that easy. The live to serve had two meanings there. So one, yeah, exactly as you're talking, it's, it's, you're serving others, you're helping others. I was where you are. Let me show you how, you know, you can better your life or just better where you are. And then the other side, the whole hip hop side, when you serve somebody, you're pretty much like owning them. Like, hey, I just <laughs> served you on the dance floor. I, <laughs> I served you some humble pie. Yeah. So we tend to think of service as, oh, you're you're meek and you're humble and you're, you're serving. It's like, well, no. And if you're going to serve somebody on the dance floor, you got to know that you're better than them. You got to know that you you have your, you know your body. You can do these moves. So it comes from a place of power. And so it's balancing that power so you don't get all egotistical. 
but also balancing with the service to the community. And that's the beautiful thing about the culture of hip hop. It's all about community respect, taking these kids that could join a gang or go break into houses instead. No, let's take out that frustration. Uh, spin on your head. You know, <laughs> don't yeah. tell your mom if you get injured, but you know, spin on your head, do a <laughs> handstand, do something. Fight for the forgotten org. You can go check out Fight for the Forgotten, the foundation that I started. It is my passion project. It is something that I love so much because of the people we get to help. We get to help the pygmy tribe who adopted me in help themselves. We say opportunity is greater than charity. Charity can be great, but opportunity is just always better. That's why we've drilled something like 80 water wells already, providing over 30,000 people clean water, We've started sustainable farms, bought back over 3,000 acres of land for the people who originally owned it, put it in their name. We built 32 homes, and now we're about to start a health center, a school, and a marketplace. They're going to have a maternity ward, a pediatrics unit, and a dental suite. You can join the Fight for the Forgotten Fight Club at fightfortheforgotten.org. We would love, love, love to invite you on this journey to join this fight arm in arm with us. Our fight club, it's a monthly giving club. You can give $5 or more a month and that empowers us to empower people. Thank you for being on this journey with us. I invite you to come along for the ride. It's been absolutely epic, putting love and compassion in action and fighting for people. Fightfortheforgotten.org, join our fight club. Well, what what do you think is one of your, one of your favorite stories or moments with, um, with someone that you've been able to serve, that you've been able to meet, that you've been able to like impact? Oh gosh. There was a young, probably I think it was about 14 year old uh, here in Austin. Uh, he was part of our church and he was going down the wrong path. And so his mom kind of saw what I was doing in the church. You know, I was this break dancing Hispanic guy and her son really was intrigued by it. So we started this mentorship, uh, this discipleship where you know, I'd spend time with him, show him these dance moves, take him out. And so started pouring my life into, into his life, started showing him like your choices matter, you know, your future matters and it's based on your choices today. Here's some dance moves. Hey, let's go to Chicano Park. Let's go see the low riders. And, but it was always like, this kite that was trying to fly away because he so adamantly wanted to be this vato cholo, you know, getting into fights, uh, gang gang banging guy. And I'm like, dude, no, there's a better life. Mm. And so one year, two years spent pouring into him. And unlike any Disney movie, there was not this happy ending. It was, yeah, he still pretty much threw his life away. He wound up in jail. And by this time I was leaving Austin to go, uh, I think I was going to college at that time. And so it was kind of this reverse thing where it was like, I just did all this helping, you know, trying to serve, but it's not always going to be a happy ending. Mm. So that got me thinking like how many other kids just like him are out there that I could pour into. Uh, fast forward another 10 years and I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of the, the meat from the story here, but there was a student at a high school in El Paso, Texas, the, the drug slinger. He, was, he didn't do drugs, but he sold drugs. Our dance crew was there doing a school assembly. I think it was Red Ribbon Month, so, you know, saying no to drugs, kids. But coming in with the, the, the popping and the, the b-boying, I think we even had a DJ there with us. And so this kid's in the audience just like, whoa, because he was a popper. He just hid that behind his drugs. He hid that part of him. But because we were there dancing, being true to who we were, he saw that, and I think he came down at the very end and started dancing with our crew thought nothing of it hey you know props you know make choices then my dance crew's here in El Paso if you want to meet up with them fast forward three years I get this phone call from this kid it's like hey Mr. Perez my name is Sonny I was at this school I was this guy in the audience like I re yeah yeah I wanted to know can I take over your dance crew I was like oh please go on well, I noticed that there's not a lot of structure anymore because you moved away. You moved back to Austin. Your dance crew's here. There's not a lot of – the leadership is is not there to bring everybody together. I would like to step into that role. Here's my story. You know, I was selling drugs, but now I've been mentoring kids in my area through popping. I'm like, 
Oh my gosh. Hmm. Here's my blessing. Rise, rise, sir, sonny of El Paso. So he took over our dance crew and began to bring it back together. So once I left, it, it just, you know, it was like, eh, it's not doing as much. But he brought it together, started doing the same exact thing that I was doing with the dance crew, serving the community, doing events, helping others learn our craft. And so that it is the heart. It's that replication. Hmm. It's you're pouring into someone and now they're going to grow. Then they're going to pour into someone. They're going to grow. And we all, everybody does this. It's just, are we doing a good job at it? Instead of like, you Being know, intentional. Here, yeah. Yeah. And instead of here, drink this 40 or, you know, smoke this, vape this. It's like, no, here, here's how you can better yourself. Drink water, not sodas. You know, it's, it's just little small things to make people better, to make the community better and to make life better. Yeah. Make the world better. Yeah. And so this guy is now in his thirties and still oversees the dance crew, took over another dance crew as well, because their leader older than me, the guy who pretty much helped mentor me in the dancing, his, his mentor handed their crew over to him too. Wow. So now he merged the two and it was this, just like, imagine, imagine had I not decided to get into dancing or even bigger. And, and I can jump into this part. Imagine had I never danced in the street at homecoming in El Paso on this night and met the other dance crew member who had built this whole dream with me. Hmm. And that's where it came down to of getting out of your own way up here. Like just do it. Just, just do it. Yeah. Just show get, up, get out there and see what happens. Exactly. You know, it might be years later, but it makes it all worth it. Oh, you yeah. get to look back and be like, Hey, it was just for this one. Yeah. This one, this one, this journey. Yep. And, and you never, uh, I and heard all of, the kids that he's impacting now. Yeah. Uh, I heard this quote is you, you can count the number of apples on a tree, but you never know how many trees are inside each apple hmm. because each seed is going to grow, grow, Can you grow. say that one more time? You never know. You can count the number of apples on a tree, but you can never count the number of trees inside the apple. Wow. And each of us, we have, we have that, but we get in our own way. I, I'm not good enough. I, I'm not a Toastmaster. I'm, I, I, I can't do this. And that's the boggling and boggling part. And that's, that's one reason I got into speaking was to help students set those goals and get out of, get out of their own way. Quit yeah. talking themselves out of becoming great. Yeah. Uh, you, you remind me of a story real quick of my mom. I've, uh, she's saved on my phone as best mom ever. <laughs> Although, uh, another one of the best moms in the world is sitting right by me. I'm uh, uh, excited to see Amy and how she loves her daughters. And, um, we just got back from Hawaii together, a, a trip together jealous, and it was just, jealous. it was awesome. <laughs> And, uh, but my mom, I'm her only child. And so there was complications in birth. She couldn't have any more children. And, you know, I've, we had like two exchange students while I was growing up, um, just cause they wanted to give back and me to have like kind of a sibling in the home. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, they did another whenever I was out of the home. But during my high school years, my mom got into big brother, big sister, and she became a big sister. And there was this, uh, her little sister was a girl named Jessica and Jessica got into wrestling because she saw me in wrestling what? <laughs> and you know, they were, they were from a rough area, low income. And, uh, she had a brother. I got to meet him a few times. Um, but I think, uh, to say it politely, she, she was the opportunity just from being mentored, I think opened her mindset up to being different than the, maybe the rest of her family or, or rest of her neighborhood. Mm. And she was the first one to go to college, got a scholarship for wrestling. Uh, she was like, a, I think a state champ or second nice. in state in, in high school. She went on to college to wrestle. Uh, that was whenever women's wrestling finally got in the NCAA and, uh, or maybe it was the NCAA, something like that. And so anyways, the whole, now she's a nurse, I believe. Cool. And, uh, it's been, it's been really cool to see what one person's impact oh, yeah. can be in someone else's life. Give you some snaps on that. Hey, yeah. 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 Mama Mayor Wren. Uh, My wife worked with, uh, well, she was a, a big sister for years, I think oh, five or six great. years. And then she went to work for big brothers, big sisters. And it, that program is what it's about. It's about giving back. It's about being available, mm. you know, being available. That that's, I mean. If you're listening to this, that's the key word today. <laughs> Just be available. <laughs> yeah. What do you think it takes to, to get out of your own way and to be available to show up for yourself, but also for others? Yeah. So the internal dialogue that we all have a lot, you know, I'm not, I don't have the time, so I don't have the time, but also I don't have the ability. 
Hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like two steps. It's getting out of your own way and then helping lead the way for somebody else. And that is, I'm going to say extra hard now because we're so distracted. Anytime we have downtime, what are we doing? Scroll, scroll, scroll. We're so distracted. We, in our own, America in itself is very individualistic. You know, it's all about me. You know, look how much I make. Look what I drive. Look what I do. But where's the community? Where's the community? And that's, it's this whole shift. And I, and I think by stories like what you were sharing is that if one person sees somebody else doing it, it it's going to replicate. That way we're not having to pull people like, we need more volunteers to help out here. Somebody is like, no, you, you want to, if you're willing to step out and quit talking yourself out of it, if you're willing to step out there and do something different, mm. that, that one of my models has always just been like, don't try to be better, just be different. And that's what we need. We need people who are willing to go against the norm. Right now with my son, Sebi. Hi, Sebi. I'm waving at you wherever you are. <laughs> so 11 months it, old? 11 months old. 11 months old. Before the pandemic, I was traveling, you know, every other week. It was great. I would burn out every four or five years. So I'm speaking professionally. And then I would just take some time to myself. But then I began to meet other speakers. And I was like, how are y'all traveling so much if you have kids? You know, who's, you know, oh, the wife watches them. I'm like, oh, okay. That's fun. And so once our little one came along, I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I want that life that I had. You know, it was great serving, speaking, doing, speaking to 5,000 people at times. But I know my little Sebi, my little Sebi dude is going to need me for the first four years at least. He's going to need me. And so we crunch numbers. You know, we crunch the numbers. We, you know, well, the real estate market is going up. We could charge more for our rental property. And so I was like, yeah, I could take a few months off from speaking. And once things went virtual during the pandemic, it was this whole other realm opened up like, well, I could still be available, but from home. So we could continue this. And so it was intention to action. And yeah, losing thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. But at the same time, yeah, I can make that money up. Uh, another buddy of mine from Toastmasters, again, Toastmasters, great organization, everybody. Uh, Ira Bat, he was a real estate mogul out in El Paso. And he would always say, you know, Patrick, you, you can always make money. You can always make more money. And it just stuck. It's like, yeah, you can always make money. If you go make 10, 30 grand in a month, why not take a few months off? Why not do something else and give back? And so I think we just need to step back and evaluate, okay, am I living in excess? You know, am I just doing stuff to please myself, you know, boost myself? Or if I lay off of working so much to hustle, I could do something else, give back, serve, help, be there for my spouse, be there for my little ones, visit my family, call my parents, play with the dog. So, mm, yeah. That's really good. So I think, um, well, one of the things you said was uh, with America, we're so individualistic. Mm. Or, uh, and I think that often comes from that side of the liberty. I mm. think that equalizer is the responsibility. Whenever oh, you tap snap. into that, right? Come when on you tap now. into... Well, I have this personal freedom. What am I going to do with mm -hmm. it to have responsibility, take responsibility for taking care of myself, but my family and everyone else or oh, those man. people I can. Yep. And so with Toastmasters switching gears a little, um, you know, public speaking is, isn't that the number one fear? Like people fear that more than death. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I hear a lot. And um, what would you say for like even the average person that maybe they're not thinking about going into schools and speaking like you do, or, uh, you know, speaking on business, maybe they do have that goal, but how important is it to be able to maybe challenge yourself, go there, do a speech in front of a small room or 10, 20 mm -hmm. people, and just to kind of hone that craft to where whatever message you're trying to get across, you're able to share it. Definitely. Definitely. And there's, there's more than just the public speaking, it's communication in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, I mean, I've been married five years now and I'm still like learning to communicate yeah. emotion, <laughs> learning yeah. to communicate so the other person understands and hears. But what I loved about Toastmasters, and I was in Toastmasters from about 2002 to about 2006, uh, okay. became president of the Amigos uh, Toastmasters, went to um, uh, one round away from world championship uh, wow. public speaking. So there's it, a competition for it. Oh, Yeah. 20,000 yeah. contestants Whoa. compete around the world. And you made it to the second to last round? I made it to the second to last round. Wow. And <laughs> I will say that I gave my best speech ever 
but it was because it was meaningful to me. It was about mm. my dad being a POW and rising up and overcoming and wow. going through the jungle with broken ankles and stuff. I mean, it was it was a story that I wanted to share for myself, for my dad. And uh, so Toastmasters, they have different modules. So there's the motivational module. There is the, I, I can't even remember, but it's not just about like, you know, be motivated. It's like, okay, we're going to talk about business. We're going to talk about different aspects. So it can help anybody, whatever field you're in. There are different levels. And then there's the uh, almost like the certified speaking professional. So like you, you know, if you gave 50 speeches paid, then you could be a certified speaking professional. But that may be an essay, one of the two. And so Toastmasters itself is just getting comfortable in the uncomfortable. Yeah, that that's the part. It's, that's jujitsu. Being uh, comfortable, being uncomfortable. Yeah, I yeah. mean that's that's it's dance. It's 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 yeah. life. It's get out there, and what it what it conditions you is to be a more polished speaker. They the one of the activities I like is they have the pennies. So every time you say um, well, uh, you know, penny, penny. Mm. So you're becoming aware of your yeah. blind spots. And then you translate stuff like that. You know, if I, I, I tend to say a lot of off the cuff things that can rub people the wrong way. So I'm like, well, if I take this skill outside of Toastmasters, I could not piss so many people off and uh, keep, keep, keep the peace. But yeah, so Toastmasters has the, the platform. It gives you the practice. And I mean, it's just a great community because you're here. I was a college student B-boy. Yo, what's up, hip hop? Here I am meeting with Bob and Ira, all these professionals and bankers from, uh, I think, Frost Bank at the time, and just surrounding yourself with people who are different than you, getting different thoughts, getting different things. And so I had my, my dance crew teaching me stuff, but then I had these leaders teaching me. And that's where the beauty of Toastmasters was. It brings so many people together. Yeah. And then you work on your craft. It's leadership and public speaking. Yeah. And then, Well, to switch gears a little bit more, can you tell me a little bit about your dad? The rise yeah. up and overcome. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm walked, say, broken ankles. Yeah. I was it's, like, it's it's something that we don't push out too much. But I'll, I'll say so for both of my parents. So my dad, small town, very small town, Arizona. My mom from uh, Chihuahua, Mexico. First, didn't speak any English coming to America. So had to go through the whole like, you know, this is America. You speak English, where teachers could hit you with a ruler oh, if wow. you didn't speak English. So they both came through their own journeys. My dad was a sniper in Vietnam, uh, one of many army rangers, sniper, tunnel rat, one of many things. And we always knew there was stuff that happened. We always knew that there was a story there. We saw the scars, we saw the wounds. Wow. But it wasn't until he actually posted uh, his VA documents in his the blue room, what we called it when we were growing up, uh, one room in the house where it was just all of his memorabilia, the blue hearts, and I mean, not blue, purple hearts. And then his story and reading that, I'm like, what the heck? So small version, my, my dad's platoon was attacked. He was the only one who managed to escape. He was captured by the Viet Cong. He spent over a year in a bamboo cage, probably no bigger than this table. Wow. Tortured daily, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping they don't listen to this. It's, it gets crazy. But every day he had a gun put against his temple, cocked, fired. Wow. But there was never a bullet in there. It was placed up to his temple so much that he started getting infections from that. Wow. He was starved. I think by the time he escaped, he weighed 80 pounds. Oh, my goodness. He, uh, he, he was just holding on by his hope, his spirit. It was that overcoming spirit of mm -hmm. just like, I'm still here. I'm still here. Fast forward about a year or so, he is just decrepit, falling apart, no teeth. Somehow he managed to break out of the little bamboo cage. Wow. Somehow he broke out of that cage, killed three Viet Cong. I mean, using elbow to temple, using bootstraps. I mean, everything. And so his ankles were broken and somehow he just pushed his way through that jungle. He pushed his way through that jungle to survive. Broken probably from, from torture. Yeah. Wow. Broken from torture, starved, yeah. uh, brittle bones from malnutrition. Yeah. I mean, that. 80 pounds. I mean, he is, he is a small frame. Uh, 
Sure, but 80 pounds yeah. is 80 pounds. Yeah, that's starvation. Yeah. He was given uh, just water that the monkeys would drink out of. Wow. So he was rescued by a re- Korean reconnaissance team. They were the ones that found him. And then, you know, they pretty much, like the robotic man, they rebuilt him over years. But so many soldiers, so many Vietnam vets especially came home to that, like, you know, oh, boo on you, boo on you. You're, you're killing children and, and everything. And to come back and not have the love of the country and then soldiers who come back, they're physically, they're still there, but they're broken, that they're still pushing their way through their own jungle, that they're still dealing with their own mental battles. So my dad came back and for him to be there, to be available for me, to be there. I remember my dad would carry me downstairs and I was like four or five, so I'd, or five or six so I could catch the bus. And to have that, like he said that, I mean, he wasn't letting the jungle torture define him, that he had pushed himself through that. And then having a mom who would want to push me to go to college, to be the first in, in my dad's side of the family, you're going to college. You know, you we, we've done this. She's a nurse. She was a nurse, retired. Mm. And so pushing and growing and supporting and loving, questioning, I will say a little small t- factoid here. My mom never liked to watch me break dance. Cause she swore the one day she watched me would be the day I break my neck, break my arm or something. Cause the nurse in her. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, just never watch me dance. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my great grandma was a nurse and she said once a nurse, always a nurse. Mm-hmm. So not was a nurse. She still is. She <laughs> yeah. just isn't practicing. It, it but, comes uh, in handy with the baby now. So I'm like, uh, okay, he's got great. a fever. What do we do? You know, yeah. <laughs> take him. Well, I think that's huge. What you said. I mean, I, I believe we, we've started to read Amy's further along than me. Uh, the body keeps the score. And it's a book on trauma, basically. And it talks about it, that there wasn't really a term for PTSD Mm -hmm. or post-traumatic stress until uh, Vietnam, uh, until after that. They had seen it, and there was leading psychiatrists that were talking about it, like after World War I or World War II, like this isn't just, you know, this is a a mental thing, like from, from the war and trauma that they saw, but... There wasn't actually a term for it mm-hmm. until after Vietnam. And thinking about that, your dad not letting that um, capture him. I mean, he was in a bamboo cell or prison that looks like it was only maybe four foot wide or less. And, you know, some people would come back, not rise up and overcome and not show up mm-hmm. for their son. So I think that, what's your dad's name? Joe. Joe. Yeah. Mine too. Joe, hey. Yeah. A, He's it was passed. A, it was a yeah. popular name. I think yeah. our generation, Joe and Mary, Maria's, and it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm grateful for Joe. Yeah, me too. That, that was yeah. a really powerful story. Yeah. And that was my Toastmaster speech. It was it was about that story. So that's <laughs> I can why it was see so, why like, it was powerful. <sighs> Uh, I wanted to ask something that this kind of segues mm-hmm. into. And yeah, I am reading Body Keeps the Score, which is really interesting. And I, I was wondering how much you see from a physiological perspective the movement of our bodies mm. for people that you help, for kids that you help, you know, encouraging them to move, how much of a difference that makes in itself. Because when you came in, you were stretching, you were you were like, I think you're a bundle <laughs> of energy anyway, but you were like nonstop, you know, moving and stretching and stuff. And I just sat right down. I was like, I should probably stretch. <laughs> um, but, you know, encouraging them to move and what that, how that moves any trauma or any bullying trauma. It's glorious. It's, I'm going to say it's, so I don't hear a lot of these stories because it's only when parents will email me or clients will tell mm-hmm. me stuff. But there's a, so there's, my whole thing is it's always like, it's not about being the best. Just get out there. Just get out there. So during my programs, my motivational school assemblies, keynotes, I get volunteers. I, I'm, mm. in case you haven't noticed, I'm an extrovert. So I'm like, <laughs> I need people around me. I can't just sit up here and talk. So I'll have students on stage. I'll have teachers on stage. I'll have CEOs on stage, dancing, moving, even to a point where they're following me. And I'm like, here, stand on your hand and touch your foot to get them out of their norm. And so some of the craziest, awesome stories that, that I hear are about one that pops up. I had an email from, a, a, I think it was a principal or the social worker, that there was a student at a school, bullied, 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 always bullied by themselves. But they were one of the few volunteers who came up on stage with me that day. And they danced. They made mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Yeah. It's how you move with that mistake. So this kid got up there, danced, 
made a fool of himself, and everybody went crazy. Uh. He went down there, the broken, bullied kid came back the most popular kid on campus. Mm. And it's not about the popularity, uh, popularity, it's about the acceptance. That yeah. the football players were too in their head to get down there. The the cheerleaders, the smartest kids were too in their head to get down there. But this little bullied kid came down there, went back. And so the email I got was like, you know, everybody is praising this kid. This kid, I mean, it's, it's that's what it means to be available. It's like, mm. use your gift. Use it for other people to mm. do something to get them out of their own way. Uh, student with autism, same thing. Uh, I think it was the client's own kid. Same thing. You know, they're autistic. They're, people try to define you by your, your disability or this or that. I'm like, he's just a dancer, a brave dancer. Mm. And so when they got out there, they got into the dancing and they're still dancing to this day. Wow. Kids who Did you say a brave dancer, yeah, just be a <laughs> just brave, that. just be brave because every I'll, I'll, that thing you're saying about you know the number one fear is public speaking. I, I hear that, but I'm like, I think a Maybe lot of people dancing is dancing in front of people, yeah. When I used to go clubbing four days a week here in Austin, it was always like I would hear people say, Well, I just got to get my liquid courage, go, 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 you know, get yeah. drunk, then they'll dance. I would have people come, I was up like and, that. Oh gosh, I, mean, I was like that. I grew brave. up, <laughs> no, I, I grew up in a uh, a school, uh, uh, and a church that said, if you dance, you go to hell. And so, oh, um, yeah. come on now. I so, can go there. Uh, <laughs> Let's go there. So anyways, Let's go yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, Amy was talking to me last night about our next date night. We're going to go dance mm. and, uh, I love it. Like, we haven't done that our, in a while. No, what, like, yeah, like, like, uh, two-stepping or no. I don't even care. No, no. Yeah. Oh my gosh. We just like music Look, and dance. Google Motown Mondays. Motown Mondays. Okay. Motown Austin, Mondays oh my gosh. Here. It'll change your life. Great. All right. We're going to go. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we go roller skate dancing. Awesome. Um, and we, yeah, that was my birthday present from Amy was lessons. That's I think we got one more left. One or two. That's a good birthday present. It was, it was. And, um, but no, I, I think what you're saying, what Amy was asking is what a lot of physical therapy for athletes are now saying, and they've adopted this now, instead of just rest and ice, they're saying movement, mm. movement is healing, just move. And I think they're talking about for the joints, but I think it's so much more like what you just said, mm -hmm. the story where you got emotional about the kid that's been bullied that movement for him was healing. He was able to be seen mm -hmm. and be free and make mistakes, but he tried and he was celebrated. Yeah. That's he was it. Accepted. Celebrating, yeah. celebrating. And that in, in b-boying breakdancing, we, we have what's called the cipher. That's the circle where people are jumping in, battling, or just showing off their skills. The beautiful thing is whether you're black, white, brown, disabled, uh, broken, nobody cares because they're celebrating your dance mm. in that circle. That's and awesome. imagine if we just took that and just celebrated those, those small little things, those just celebrate those small things in your kid, in your student. And yeah, I, I wanted to body slam a lot of my students when I was teaching, but I would celebrate those one, two little things that I could find. Uh, oh, you're, you're a TikTok influencer. Let's celebrate that. Let's screw all the teaks and standardized testing that you need. Let's talk about your platform. Celebrate, celebrate. Uh, one, I remember one show we did was at a, uh, like a rehabilitation center in El Paso. And so they were like, well, a lot of our kids are going to be in rehabilitation wheelchairs. for, okay. Physical. Yeah. yeah physical. Yeah. So wheelchairs, uh, amputees. I was like, yeah, we'll, we'll show videos of break dancers with one leg. We'll show videos of break dancer paraplegics because there, the only thing stopping us, it, it's up here saying we can't. And, uh, one of the old, old school dancers, handyman, you know, he would come out in his little crutches and then, I mean, just blow everybody out of the water. Uh, Amy, can you try to pull up Nick Santanastasso, uh, yeah. on Instagram, <clears throat> see if there's a dance video of him or something while we pull that up. So my buddy, Nick, he was actually, when I was coming up with this podcast and said, you know, who are overcomers and who would be the you know, the top of my, who would be the first guest, best guest that I, that we could set the tone, set the stage for the show. Mm -hmm. And it's my buddy, Nick and Nick will open anywhere. Tony Robbins speaks. Uh, oh, nice. he's friends wow. with Ed Milet, Steve Aoki, uh, uh, all sorts of people. <laughs> Is that him dancing? Yeah. Let's see if we can pull it up. <laughs> so he there was born with a very rare degenerative disease, um, or just a 
birth, nice. birth <laughs> defect, but he's, he's incredible. He's got one arm, I think with maybe one finger and no legs, no arms or no missing an arm. And his whole thing, I love him. I love him because he's literally one of the most inspiring human beings that probably has ever lived. Mm. And what is he, Amy? 25, 26? 20, he's probably 26. 26 now. now. We've been to fights with him and we've traveled together and we spoke together and he's raised funds for Fight for the Forgotten. And he grew up being bullied some mm. and uh, questioning if he should continue living. And his parents would put a fork down in front of him with his food and say, learn how to eat. Right. Wow. And, uh, and so he had to learn to, to live, um, despite his disability. Yeah, that's like Cobra Kai status. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, his parents were incredible. <laughs> yeah, so awesome. incredibly supportive too. They just knew that they needed to challenge him. And he says the greatest disability is a bad mindset. That's the greatest disability. Yeah. And coming from him, where he'll go swimming and snowboarding and uh, flip tires that weigh as much as oh I gosh. do. <laughs> um, where where when he does it, it almost looks scary because it could come back on top of him. But he knows he's going to get it over, mm -hmm. even though it weighs 200, 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, just an incredible human being that um, thinking about his story and how, if the listeners haven't heard that, go back to the first episode. I'd encourage you to, man, because yeah, it, no, is, that it is incredible. inspiring where, I mean, to 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 wrestle he literally on his, now he calls it his potato, his, his arm that, uh, is shaped like a potato. And, uh, but it used to be eight inches longer, but to be able to wrestle, just to have the opportunity to wrestle, he watched his older brother wrestle, saw him. He was accepted by people. He wasn't being very accepted by, at the school. He said, I want to wrestle. And the doctor said, you can't mom said you can't because his bone was actually growing and it was like sharpened almost oh, like wow. a toothpick or like a knife. Mm -hmm. And so if he posted with that arm, it was going to just come straight through oh, his gosh. skin. Dang. So he goes, well, cut it off. And they go, Nick, don't be so extreme. <laughs> what are you talking about? That's next and level. And so literally said, is it possible if we, if we cut it, if we amputated it, could I wrestle? And it's the doctors go, well, well, maybe, but you don't know what you're considering. Like, Nick, you're already missing this stuff. Why would you cut this off? He goes, because it'll give me a chance. And so literally just to have the chance wow. to step on the mats, he had to cut off his arm, eight that inches of it, six inches, eight inches of it. That is crazy. It was something, something like that. that. Yeah. It's like we're, we're having church. Come on. What do you need to cut off people? <laughs> what do you need to cut off from your life to get through that jungle? That is insane. <laughs> yeah. That is, I mean, and, and yeah, the, the mindset, you know, mm. as he was saying, that's, that's the key. It's the mindset. Uh, I'll even throw out a, a, a guy for y'all, uh, Josh Elusive Vineyard from Austin. He was the only one from Austin to make it to the semifinals of America's Got Talent. A phenomenal break dancer. He was a stunt double in Spider Man and all these movies. Wow. He was born deaf. Wow. He was. He had, I think, like six operations on one ear, eight in the other. And to be the phenomenal dancer he is, he had to go through the ridicule, getting bullied, teased, taunted, yeah. the speech impediments. Uh, it's it's always. You never know what's possible till you're willing to step out there, give it a shot, fail, fail forward, turn your mistakes into moves. So can he hear the music? Oh yeah. Like he's good now. Like, oh, okay. he, yeah, he can still hear, but I mean, he is just a beast. He is a wow. beast and the, the humblest, nicest guy you'll ever meet. What was his name again? Josh Vineyard. Uh, elusive okay. is what we call him. Okay. Awesome. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get you in touch with his people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> do you still have to, like you were talking about, you know, overcoming your own mind. Do you still have things that you have to overcome in your oh, own mind? Oh, definitely. Oh and my gosh, yeah. What, do you, what are they and what do you do? So just for the listeners, so I have spoken in 48 states. I have danced to close to 600, 700,000 people live in person. I, you know, that that's who, what I do, but I'm still in my head, not in front of like, I'm going to go dance in front of 1,500 students at this leadership conference, but LA, I went to visit my buddy Gabriel. Uh, he was the one that I met in El Paso. We go to this club where it's all the dancers who dance for music videos and Beyonce. It's like all the professional dancers. So I get into that environment and I, I clam up. I'm just like, <sharp inhale> I get back into my little eighth grade self where I'm like, oh crap, I'm not as good as these people. They're going to make fun of me. If they make fun of me, they're not going to like me. If they don't like me, they're not going to accept me. And so I still get in my head when I'm in smaller groups, but I deliberately put myself there because I know it still freaks me out. And so in moments like that, in this story, it was my buddy Gabriel who literally like just kept nudging, get in there, get in there. And that's where community comes in. You know, the mm. mindset, then the community, get in there. I'm like, nah, dude, nah. Because I mean, I, I get scared when I see better dancers, I get scared. 
And so I got into that circle, not for him, not for everybody else, but for myself, because it scared me. I still go to open mics, even though I have spoken professionally for 15 years now, I'll go to open mics because that scares me to be in front of eight or nine people. Uh, the last time I did one, I was wearing my Fitbit. I'm like, heart rate, 119. <laughs> I'm really scared. Why? I do this for a living. What the heck? But when you get comfortable, that's when you begin dying. When you get comfortable, when, mm. when your plane is no longer fighting the, the wind and turbulence and rising, it's, it's, you just start coming down. So I'm like, yeah, open mics scare me. Uh, being open emotionally scares me. It stuff like that because you know it's easy to hide behind the like the dancer the hype man the excitement but you get into the deepness and this is you know one thing my wife and I are kind of journeying through is like you get into the deepness of you know who I am it's like yeah there's there's issues there's breakups there's heartaches there's uh, lost opportunities that I'm like yeah maybe you know it's the wounds are still there and instead of like dealing with it you know PTSD type of thing instead of dealing with it we just callous over it Hide it behind mm. our success. Hide it behind our nice car. Hide it behind our our platforms. And so, yeah, it's it's still scary at times to get outside <clears throat> of my norm. One of the things that Amy told me before I went to treatment this last time was she wrote wrote it down on a I had like forty something post it notes that I could post on my wall every day I was there. And one of them, and it reminded me of your story of like just your friend nudging you. And you're like, I'm not doing it for him or them. I'm doing it for me. It was face it all, feel it all, and magic mm, happens. Say it again. I, face it all, feel it all, and magic happens. Nice. Or that's the place that miracles are born, yeah. right? When you face it all, when you feel it all, like that's whenever good things can happen because you're wow. challenging yourself. Yeah. You're, you're putting yourself in you're the uncomfortable. You're digging into it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, gosh. That's, yeah. So what what's a moment in your life that you've had to rise up, overcome, or one of life's greatest challenges that you've really had to like, it was hard, but you know what? I'm, I'm either grateful for it or I grew through it. Yeah. I'm going to, there's a lot of little things I want to throw out there, but I'm going to say the entrepreneurship journey. Cause right now in our heightened social media world, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Everybody's like, Oh, I'm going to go do this and make six figures tomorrow. When I, when I was hearing you tell, tell your story about, you know, I was turning away these gigs. I was, when I started speaking, I was lying face down in my living room in El Paso, crying out to God, Lord, I am broke. I have no money. I need speaking gigs. What is it going to take? What is it going to take? I was getting acid reflux. I think my hair was starting to thin. I mean, it was just the stress of maxing out my Visa card because I maxed out my MasterCard just to get by because I had this vision, this dream of using speaking and dance as a, a, a bridge to help. And so that was the most challenging because I knew that's, that's the hard part. I knew that I could always just go back to my parents. My mom was always a very giving woman. You know, she, they went through their hardships so I could have, you know, that's a thing with, uh, with first gen, with, uh, student, uh, college bound Hispanic students. It's like your parents want what's best for you. So my mom was paying my way through college. And I was like, no, I need the struggle because that's where my story begins in that struggle. So I'm cutting you off financially. It's this weird thing to say, but I'm cutting you off financially so I can do this on myself. I was 40,000 in debt, credit card debt. I mean, just like, how am I going to get shows? I can't even market. So the, that beginning of my entrepreneurial journey was just devastating, heightened by a very bad breakup that put me into a depression. And so it was kind of just, going back to my dad, it was like just crawling crawling through that jungle a lot of people think you got to be able to crawl 10 year yards but like if you can just crawl like two feet that's progress crawl another two feet that's progress and so i always had this notion that because i'm a believer i i, I follow christ i'm a believer everything's going to work out for me we are his chosen that it was going to just be easy that i'm going to step out there and speak and all the doors are going to open up but it was banging on door after door after door, a hundred no's to every one yes. And so that journey, which, and the reason I want to share this is because a lot of people who are out there starting their journey, their own business, their coaching, consulting, that it's going to take time. 
And that's one thing we forget that a lot of things take time, relationships, uh, marriages, uh, businesses that takes time. And so in my journey, it was my first year I made $10,000 speaking, which was enough to survive. Second year, I made 20,000. Third year, 40,000. So it, there was progress, but I, I was always waiting for that moment where I would have my break. Then it would just be easy, easy, easy. I was waiting for that. And I've been waiting for that for the last <laughs> like 20 years. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. Even those moments where I got picked up by speaking bureaus and not, then I was speaking in front of, I mean, international leadership conferences. I was still like, is this my break? Is this going to be it where I don't have to hustle and crawl? Like, no, you keep hustling. You keep crawling. It's kind of morbid, but it's like, you just keep crawling until you crawl into your grave. (laughs) (laughs) It's sad and morbid, but no, it's, it's, it's just that, that hard nature of, and then questioning yourself. So in that time I was, I had just graduated uh, University of Texas, El Paso, had this, I was the entrepreneur of the year, ironically, even though I was broke, but they saw I was making money, but it was just this like, do I tap out? Do I quit? Or do I keep going so I can serve others? And then the, the biggest thing that happens is the comparison trap. Mm. I remember one event I was doing. Comparison is the thief of joy. Oh yeah. It's, it, it kicks you between the legs. It, it's not a friend. (laughs) I was doing this free event because everybody keeps, especially artists, artists out there, creatives, you always hear this, it's going to get you exposure. It's going to, it's like pfft, BS. No, it, it, it's not. I was doing this free event for a nonprofit and they had me literally outside at the university, outside on this little small dance floor. Everybody's eating lunch, so they're ignoring me. And I'm like, why am I out here in the sun? There's ants on this dance floor. <laughs> 200 yards away in the, uh, the civic center there, not uh, the, University Center, the big uh, basketball, Don Haskins, there was another speaker that I, uh, that I knew, uh, Josh Shipp. He was in there speaking, getting paid, I think like 3,500 or 3,000 or something. So I was just the one, I was like, why am I out here dying for all these people ignoring me when he's in there? This isn't fair, blah, blah. Or you learn from people like that. And so that's what I did. I, you know, messaged and eventually we did meet. I went to his boot camp. Uh, eventually was picked up by his the bureau he was a part of. And so a lot of times we we start having that self pity, self pity. I'm not making enough. I'm not. I can't do this. But it's like comparing is not going to help you. You you take what you can. You learn from who you can. And then uh, I had one mentor tell me once you learn what I've taught you, you teach somebody else. Mm. You teach somebody else. And so that's the small micro version, but I I will share this story. This is kind of the story that I I wanted to throw out there about just getting out of your own way, taking a chance. So every dancer has a story. Every dance has a history. This history begins in 2001, El Paso, Texas. So uh, it was homecoming at the university there. And last song of the night, the DJ's doing his thing. And I just, I was sitting there with some other students, international students, just talking, meeting people. Hey, what's your major? Where are you from? And I had this thought, like, why not do something different? Get out of the norm. Don't just meet people. Do something. So I had this thought, like, why not just go b-boy, break dance in the middle of the street? Because there's not a scene on the, on the campus. Just do something different. Oh, everybody's going to think you're stupid. Do it anyway. So my internal dialogue so I got up out of my chair, walked over to where the DJ was, and he was just DJing on the street area. And I just started breakdancing in the middle of the street. And people start forming a circle around me like, oh, what is this guy <laughs> doing? Oh, my gosh, that's pretty cool. You know, golf clap. Well, this girl uh, that was at the table came over and was like, go dance again. I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm going to impress this girl now. <laughs> so I get back out there and I start going all out in this big group of people form this huge circle because when you do something different, people take notice. Uh, you know, I'm out here, this breakdancing Mexican out of nowhere, just going down on, on the street. So all these people form a circle and I'm like, this is awesome. I finally got out of my head. I'm not talking myself out of this. I'm dancing and all of a sudden, boom, from the opposite end of that circle, this other dancer jumps in. And this guy, I like, he comes out like on his hands and he's hand hopping and all this crazy stuff. I'm like, what the heck is this? Like moves I had never seen before. Well, this guy jumps into the circle, starts calling me out. Like he wants to battle. 
And this is kind of where I rewind everything because this was a battle of me and him, but it was also a battle between me and up here. Yeah. Your greatest opponent is yourself. Yeah. And so I, as soon as I saw him, I reverted back to little middle school Patrick, like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. I should just stop. I, I can't compete with that. And he, he was phenomenal, phenomenal. But it's in those moments where we want to talk ourselves out of something that could make us or break us, keep us great, keep us or keep us stuck. So I decided just to keep on dancing. Then just see what happens, you know, win, lose, it's going to be a cool story one day. So yeah. get back out there. So I start going back out there. Then he comes back. And by this time, the crowd is just like, what, what is happening here? Cause this is El Paso. I mean, this had not been seen at the university. So we're dancing. And as soon as we're done, like both of us are like, our hands are black from the asphalt, but shirts are all like dirty. And I, for some reason, I just walked over to him. I'm like, dude, <laughs> give him a prop. I'm like, dude, that was sick. Uh, my name is Patrick. I'm from Austin. I want to do b-boying to help students. I just told him my mission. I want to use this to help others. And he looked at me, dude, me too, <laughs> me too. So right then and there, I met Gabriel Lozano, the sickest dancer from the Southwest. We partnered up with this vision to use breakdancing b-boying to impact our community. He introduced me to sick Rick, who was just as phenomenal as him. And then Carol, my neighbor at, at the university, she was like, well, I want to learn to dance too. So she joined us. All of a sudden, we had this little Avengers group of like-minded individuals who wanted to use dancing to make an impact in our community because each of us had somebody who made a difference in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so little by little, let's we're going to dance at the YMCA. <clears throat> we're going to dance here on campus. We're going to just do all these freebies until we started getting pushback from the university and the university is like, well, you can't do this because you're a liability. If you hurt yourself, you could sue us. So we're like, well, that sucks. What do we got to do to not be a liability? Well, you have to become a 501c3 nonprofit. Then you can be a club sanctioned by the university. Okay. How do we do that? That's what you got to figure that out. So that got incorporated. 501c3 did the paperwork. Little by little. Which isn't, isn't super easy. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. It was. <laughs> I I've, was been, actually, I've been there. I was working. The form 1023. Oh, yeah. Is it's it's, even it's, it's than... Yeah. And then you're like in a probation period. All the, I mean, I was doing it in between shifts. I was working at a Brackenridge Hospital in the summer. I would come back and work at the hospital here. So I was just up at two in the morning, just, you know, doing this paperwork. We became nonprofit. Then the same university that was like, y'all can't do this was like, hey, can we pay y'all to uh, perform here in the union? Can we pay y'all for this? And little by little, our crew began to grow. Our reputation began to grow. Uh, the youth initiative program let us perform. So all these agencies saw us and little by little we were spreading. And then Red Bull came along like, hey, you guys want to perform at the military base? Wouldn't it be cool if we did this event? Y'all want to do this event? So we just all of a sudden we had this movement all from that one little dance battle that me and this guy had. And to this day, we're still friends. Uh, me and him traveled from Alaska to West Virginia doing American Lung Association programs tobacco prevention, using dance and our stories. But we've been on this journey together all because of one decision to not talk myself out of dancing. And for him too, he was leaving the university. He was leaving that night. And then they saw these feet up in the air <laughs> in this circle. He's like, what? So they came over and uh, him and his buddy Fernie came over and, and, and the rest is history. And he's now in California. Uh, he's performed with artists. He is he teaches celebrity celebrities children how to dance. So we both had our, our past, our missions, but for that point in time, we were just doing our lead and courage and dance. That that was our organization, 501c3. And then Sonny came along and took over years later. And That's all, awesome. all just from that one little moment in time. And so well, that's great. Thank you for dancing. sharing that. Yeah, keep on dancing. Keep on dancing out there, people. <laughs> Y'all too. Keep on dancing. Motown Monday. Yes. <laughs> Motown Monday. Maybe that's what we do. Monday's our date night. It is. Oh, yeah. hey, perfect. Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, how can people find you and support you? Like, if someone wants to book you for speaking or dancing, or if people want to follow even your business journey, I know you have two different websites. Can you please Definitely. share that? Yeah. So PatrickPerez.org or on the east side PatrickPerez.org. <laughs> That is my business website. You can find all of my social media on there as well. So patrickbettis.org. And then highimpactprograms.org is a business that my wife and I 
joined together on. She comes from a very corporate leadership background. Here's the website up if you're watching yeah. on Spotify or YouTube. And so my wife and I joined forces about five years ago using her brains and knowledge about the corporate world and the my high energy craziness to start doing these programs. So you can find us on there. Uh, you can watch our videos pre-pandemic when I was still youthful and young. <laughs> no, that's and then what too. is it on social? We're going to put all this in the show notes. Sure. But so just... Patrick Pacman Bettis. Patrick Pacman Perez, or what I will do, uh, you can go to patrickperez.org backslash Ren, and I'll put all my socials on there as well. Okay. To make it easy. So patrickperez.org backslash Ren, yeah. and then I'll put everything on there. Ren, so. like W R E M? Yeah. Okay. Just, just like yeah, you. There we go. Awesome. Yeah, you're, you're the star. Well, great. <laughs> now, hey, thank you so much for being here. And if you just had one, maybe one message you could share. Actually, let's do this. I asked my grandpa this before he passed. And I'll always remember it, but I said, Papa, if you could say something to your friends, your family, maybe even the world, and you could just put it on a billboard. And so it might be just a sentence or two, but if it was something from your life, you would want to pass on to others from the life that you lived, just to sum it up in a billboard, what would you say? That's so good. I used to ask a lot of people the same thing. Really? So, yeah. I would okay. always ask people older than me, like, what is your words of wisdom? To keep it simple, billboardy, get out of your own way and just keep on dancing. Hmm. Whatever your dance is, just get out of your own way, keep on dancing. Hashtag like live to serve. Hashtag live to serve. Yeah, live to serve. I love it, my man. Thank you so much for being this here. This was amazing. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. So the, I kudos to what you're doing, giving you spirit fingers, both of you. Spirit <laughs> Thanks, fingers. So. Appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thank you. And for those listening, please follow Patrick and check out his websites. And if you want to support the show, you can like or rate, review, subscribe on Spotify, YouTube, uh, Apple, and you can also support on it, our sponsor of the show by going to on it.com slash overcome, save yourself some money, support the show, support the best supplements in the world. In my opinion, thank you so much for being here. Thanks brother. Snaps, snaps, <laughs> snaps. Hey, don't forget to send your overcome stories to overcome podcast at gmail.com and also rate review, subscribe and follow overcome with Justin Wren.